morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. A pleasure uh, being here once again in Las Vegas. So here are my conflicts of interest. I think the strongest conflict that I have is that I'm strongly influenced by Joel. You can see here, um, 2009 was in, uh, at that time in Santa Monica, three weeks after my arrival. Uh, so and she and, and I myself, we wore the same jacket as he did, <laughs> same trousers, <laughs> same belt, same shirt, same smile. So that was our influence after three weeks. And for me, myself, it was a strong influence in terms of how I did the, um, or how I've done the anterior, or my way of totally involved plastic change in Switzerland from that approach to an anterior approach, and this is how I do it. I use the HANA table exactly the way he does it with self retractors a standard system, quite a pinnacle, um, the biggest possible head diameter, less than 36 millimeters, bearing usually ceramic on uh, highly across the poly, polyethylene, ceramic on ceramic in young hips, in elderly hips, a cold chrome, and in high risk patients, I go for dual mobility um, uh, combination. I always use fluoroscopy for top orientation, leg length, and offset. Now what I want to achieve is, and that's my first priority, is a stable hip. So if you have an unstable hip, the patient's going to blame you to what have you done with the hip, something went wrong. So that's my first priority. Now if the patient has a worn out hip 15, 20 years after he stopped the bottom class and everything went fine, then you probably did a great job. Then he says, well, I was happy and I was very active with my own hip. Uh, what can we do about that? So that's my second priority. You can call it a kind of egoistic, but that's actually how it is. And um, I strongly recommend that also to my residents when they do that. Now what about the intraoperative fluoroscopy? And I'm not going to talk about details about antiversion, inclination, definition, etc. We may be do that afterwards. So I do it in a very pragmatic way. So if the opening of the cup is half of the diameter in a fluoroscopy you during surgery, you have about 25 degrees of radiographic antiversion. So if you have a cup uh, like that, so you have a 45 degrees of inclination, then you can just overlay it on templates that you can create on yourself, and uh, then you will see how much antiversion you have roughly. That's something that my resident uh, do uh, sometimes, and I don't think it's desirable to have a direct integration of such a software or such a technology into the fluoroscope rather than additional hardware in the OR. So where are we with this uh, with this navigation, improvements navigation technique? So we check that. We check when we switch from lateral approach to the anterior spine approach with a very sophisticated methods so we could calculate um, a very accurate the cup orientation. What we could see in terms of inclination was that we had somewhat less uh, inclination compared to the transfer to lateral approach, which at that time was um, a 10 or more years ago our standard approach. We had a narrower standard deviation, so we were more precise uh, compared to our standard techniques, which we thought were um, the, the current state of art. The same thing, actually, for antiversion. What we saw for antiversion was that we had a narrower standard deviation, but we put it up in, into more antiversion. So this was, for us, clinically acceptable. We have less outliers. We, we talk not about outliers of the same zone, outliers of uh, the statistical means. So we had smaller standard deviation with the anterior approach. So in all the hips that we have done in my new institution, the institution from 2019, it's an academic treatment center, multiple surgery, including the change of the learning technique. We had one single dislocation, and dislocation rate of about 0.1% with this type of uh, method. And we did not do any specific adaption for stiff spine hip users or reduced mobility hips as spine users. So it seems to work. The other thing that I do is, um, I tend to do more antiversion if I have a deficient anterior wall and I check for the psoas uh, tendon, and I want to have the anterior rib really covered, um, uh, very, very covered by the bone, and not to have conflict because if you do have psoas impingement afterwards, you have lost. Either you have to change the cup, or you have to cut the psoas, which I don't do in those uh, in those sections. That's something that I did. Now, do you have more wear if you uh, have less inclination and somewhat more antiversion? With this type of combination that I've been using, you don't, unless your inclination remains low, as you can see here. So once you have more than 25 degrees of antiversion and an inclination of less than 50 degrees, then you, have don't, you don't have more wear. So it's safe regarding wear. Now, what about total hip orthoplasty in Switzerland? So this is a, an extract from our uh, registry in Switzerland. More than half of our patients are done through an anterior approach, uh, about 85% through minimal invasive approach, so some anterolaterals, and only about 10% through posterior approach. 
So we have about 177,000 hips into this registry. The dislocation rate actually is 0.038% of all primary hips. So dislocation is, uh, uh, I don't think, not a problem anymore. We have other problems. Even in a revision, dislocation only accounts about 9% of all those cases. So we have much more of a problem in terms of long-time problems um, uh, rather than dislocation. So dislocation is not an issue anymore. What is the philosophy or my philosophy of total orthoplasty? It has to be simple, reproducible, forgiving, also kind of pragmatic. I don't have to think about... Uh, the position too much, so we take one orientation and it should work because I want to teach at a resident, I want to reduce the learning curve. I would like to have as little hardware as possible in the OR, no excessive preoperative planning or radiographic examinations if possible, and it should work for about 99% of all hips. So the aim, I think, is if you put a total hip is to, to reduce outliers and not to put the cup with one degree of increments with a precision, since we don't really know where a safe zone or the real target zone is. So it's probably more a cloud than just a specific value. So the safe zone is dead. We know that already. Long lives the safe zone. As you can see here, still in the year 2023, we still publish about safe zones. And this reminds me to the current activities in the UK. Um, and I think we have to stop, uh, stop uh, talking about the safe zone more to the general uh, technique itself. And is this working for a whole bunch of your patient and even uh, uh, for the majority, majority of the patient? Now, data on cup inclination are quite reproducible because they are easy to measure on x-rays and they are also related to wear and dislocation. Data on cup and version are either inexistent in the literature if you go to the publications, contradictory, or somewhat unprecise because different techniques of measurements have been used, influenced also by pelvic position, etc. And there are also data, data on femoral torsion actually is, um, is, are even rarer. And we checked our hips. So all the hips that came in for uh, preathletic problems, we do a lot of joint preservation too. We check what is the range in terms of antiversion of the acetabulum and in terms of femoral torsion. And we just checked those hips and what you can see was the range of acetabular version. So these are the patients that would at some point get a total hip where you can still measure antiversion without any osteophytes. We found about a 40 degree range of antiversion. We found a 100 degree range of femoral torsion, which is more than 200% of the range. So I think actually the femoral torsion is generally under-recognized. And what I see if I do revisions in those cases, uh, it's probably as least, at least as often a problem as the cup orientation. To. Choice of femoral head size, we've heard about that. So you can gain some range of motion in the prosthesis, probably not into the patient, but it will give you some kind of freedom. I don't use 40 millimeter um, heads here, but I do use dual mobility um, in very selected cases or indication about 3% of all cases. When do I use it? For instance, if you have a very small patient, so this is a patient who had um, uh, a 42 cup which would end up in a 22 head. And here I think it's very elegant to use a dual mobility component. Or if you have a femoral uh, uh, torsion of 73 degrees, also here in this high risk of dislocation patient, you can do exactly the same. And here we also had to increase the offset to get rid of the posterior impingement too. Is this a concern in terms of long-term survival? No, as far as we know, the survivorships are good. In a very recently published systematic review, this was actually um, um, uh, shown. So we don't think this is really a problem. What about hip-spine relationship? In my practice, I'm talking about Switzerland, one of the oldest patient populations that exists uh, in the world. We have an excellent access to surgical treatment, to spine uh, surgeons. The advantage, Joe, is that I can reset it on my own. <laughs> so in my clinical practice, it does not seem to be a relevant and commonly seen problem in terms of dislocation. And quite often you end up with very complicated algorithms, which I have a hard time to teach to my resident. It's a cumbersome preoperative evaluation. And then if you look at the adjustments that you have to make in terms of uh, uh, inclination and version, they are between plus minus um, 10 degrees. That's about the precision that sometimes you can do during surgery. So, and again, so if a stiff spine like here and in the supine uh, position, the patient would be like that, you can just superimpose it and use this technique of fluoroscopy guided um, a cup implantation exactly with this patient too. I don't do any adaptions at all, and it seems to work. 
So in summary, I can say the anterior approach with the fluoroscopic guidance reduced our outliers compared to the traditional approach. More antiversion and less inclination with an anterior approach is safe. In my personal practice and also nationwide, in Switzerland regarding dislocation rate, psoas impingement, long time wear. And I think we have to go in terms of a pragmatic way to deal with path anatomies of the femur and the acetabulum, as well as variations of the hip spine relationship using some, if possible, larger head, 36 millimeter whenever possible. That's my personal opinion. Dual mobility implants in very selected cases. And of course, the maximum preservation of the periarticular hip muscle mantle. Thank you very much.